not everything in the United Federation of Planets is under Starfleet control, although it may seem like that to viewers of the shows, this is simply because the shows primarily follow Starfleet personnel on starships star trekking across the stars. But it isn't the only way to travel. Hi, Rick here today and we're looking at the alternates within the UFP that provide interstellar transport. One of the biggest presences that the Federation has outside of Starfleet in space is its extensive network of cargo ships. Money between Federation worlds is an absent concept, and replicators can create a large number of materials and devices for colonies and citizens. However, this does not create a truly want-for-nothing society. Some materials, such as dilithium or latinum, cannot be replicated and have a number of uses, and many original material goods are preferable to replicated ones. The trade of foodstuffs, for example, is still commonplace, with many agricultural worlds electing to grow their own crops or raise their own cattle when they can and perhaps share these resources. The Earth Cargo Service has existed since before even the United Federation of Planets, and, as it operates from one of the core worlds of the organisation, remains one of the chief conveyors of material goods outside of Starfleet. They operate a fleet of cargo vessels, to which independent captains and crews register their services. Such ships are predominantly cargo vessels, obviously being the most efficient at transport, and the early days of Earth's interstellar voyages, they were often limited in the speeds and armament capacity, a trend that continues into the 24th century. This is because it was institutions like Starfleet that were pioneering most starship technology, and so the benefits were slower to make their way to civilian sectors. Cargo vessels, therefore, would undertake month-long voyages at low warp hauling whatever supplies they were contracted to take. As such, crews aboard these vessels tended to be much closer knit than those on Starfleet vessels, as these crews were seldom rotated out and a ship often became a home, while cargo a family business. One such freighter was the ECS Horizon, operated by the Mayweather family in the 22nd century. Originally, these vessels operated to service Earth and her colony worlds, but as humanity's reach grew, they too adopted a wider client base. The Earth Cargo Service is not the only option either. Many smaller ventures have opened up, such as Cassidy Yates Interstellar Freights, which is a small operation run in Bajor and neighbouring sectors as well as Earth. It's headed by Cassidy Yates Cisco, and as of 2399, is still flourishing, having originally only had a single vessel, the SS Xosa, part of the Bajoran Ministry of Commerce. Starfleet did manage its own transport sector too, and made use of ships such as the Wallingburg class, which was a Starfleet-made tug to which cargo canisters could be affixed. Away from transport, many scientific organisations operated their own research vessels outside of Starfleet control. Although frequently, researchers operate in cohort with Starfleet due to the nature of the exploratory organisation, its vast resources, and the connections to other political, scientific, or diplomatic entities. A good example of this Starfleet cooperation lay in the 2260s era ship, the USS Intrepid. This Constitution-class vessel was on extended loan to the Vulcan Science Academy and had operated a completely Vulcan crew. This shows a huge commitment from Starfleet to the Vulcans, and I doubt that such a hefty loan would be given to a species that wasn't a founding member, but unfortunately, this vessel was lost to a giant space bacterium. Another tale is that of the USS Raven NAR32450, a specialised, Starfleet-constructed science vessel that was given over to Magnus and Aaron Hansen in 2354 to investigate claims of a cybernetic race spotted deep in the Beta Quadrant. This vessel, although constructed by Starfleet, was under Federation jurisdiction and civilian operation. However, it disobeyed Federation orders and crossed into the neutral zone before being swept up by a Borg transwarp corridor and being deposited in the Delta Quadrant. 
Nonetheless, there are many organisations which operated in cohort with Starfleet to conduct scientific studies or to ferry colonists, so if your motivation aligned with Starfleet's mission parameters, then they would be a go-to choice as temporary custodians of your persons and belongings. Such examples are too numerous to mention, but we do see this frequently in TNG, with the Enterprise itself acting as eager hosts to several scientific minds and their personal missions, or providing a new colony world with materials and members. In fact, there are several types of Starfleet vessel designed exclusively for these sorts of duties. The infamous Oberth class was basically a science lab with a warp drive, and several of these even ended up in use by organisations outside of Starfleet, such as the SS Vico NAR-18834. There are also simply passenger ships, or star liners as they are sometimes called. These are vessels that simply run passengers between systems, much as public transport between cities. Such vessels ran across established routes throughout Federation space and beyond, but the exact relation between the Federation and these entities is unclear. One would suspect that they are mostly independent ventures, perhaps affiliated with the worlds to which they operate, but there are records of Starfleet-owned liners, such as the USS Constantinople, which was classified as a passenger liner. Another source of interstellar vehicles not part of Starfleet would be from the member world's own military, or pre-Federation forces. Remember, just because a planet joins the Federation it does not mean it loses its government and associated institutes, so while some aspects are merged into Starfleet, many remain independent and under the sole ownership of the world's own forces. This goes double for our member world's own commerce sectors, they just have to adapt to the currency-less framework of the Federation. Colony planets too often had their own ships for transport and defence. Such ships included the Erwin class SS Santa Maria BDR-529, which again was constructed by a Federation allied facility but was not a Starfleet vessel. Finally, there are those who are simply Federation citizens and own their own starships. Independent ship owners are common throughout all quadrants and systems, and each has their own reasons for flying. How they acquire a vessel is still up for speculation, as money does not change hands, and quite how the economy of such systems works is tactfully avoided. You could always acquire or build your own craft too, but again, how these privately owned ships end up in the hands of someone who wants them is a bit of a mystery with no real purchase option in the Federation. As you've no doubt noticed, a frequent theme in these independent services is the exchange of currency. Even though the Federation does not use money, and the UFP run liners only require you book passage, other powers in the galaxy do use cash. Independent ship owners can travel beyond the borders of UFP space and be protected by Federation citizen status. There are few restrictions on who you can do business with, so from what we've seen, such independent crews may require monetary compensation in some form if their travels take them beyond the comparatively privileged Federation space. A good example of this is Captain Rios of the La Serena, who takes payment from his charges depending on the location they need to be couriered to. This money likely goes towards the upkeep of his vessel. After all, I doubt a Ferengi or a garage on Freecloud would repair his ship for free. One theme is also rather apparent. It is rather hard to completely avoid Starfleet, and even more so, the Federation involvement if you live in their space, even if you're not a member world. Many of the ships built for interstellar travel tend to be made by a UFP world using Starfleet technologies, or even straight out of Starfleet itself, even if they've relinquished ownership of the vessel. The reasoning for this is simple. One of the founding principles of the Federation was mutual cooperation and a sharing of technology, and Starfleet makes a point to involve itself in the efforts of others to expand its capabilities. This is done out of a desire to improve all, but it's not hard to interpret the motivations as less pure and more controlling. 
especially as the non-Starfleet vessels tend to be so underwhelming on a technological level, often being the target of pirates and raids. Then again, Starfleet does also operate to protect these vessels, regardless of origin and affiliation. In summary, if you wanted to travel between worlds without Starfleet, there are options out there, but you may even be required to pay for it. As a Federation citizen, that might pose a problem unless you have some privately owned capital, something to barter with, or you can utilise whatever UFP created system is in place for this sort of situation. Of course, you could always claim to be a theoretical physicist who has invented a new warp system to get the resources and all the travel you need for free from Starfleet, but then they'd have a not so subtle say in the direction of your work. In these cases, Starfleet has been known to turn over entire vessels to Federation allied science teams, with the presumable caveat that any breakthroughs be shared as seen with the Intrepid and the Hansen family on the Raven. Maybe I'll do another video more focused on the scientific communities of the Federation, but this about covers all the options you have for interstellar travel that I could think of. If I've missed one, let me know, but I think most options fit into one of these categories. I do like how Starfleet could be interpreted as more meddlesome than its moral motivations suggest. For example, if the Raven had encountered some friendly cyborgs and not the Borg, do you really think Starfleet would have allowed the Hansons to retain control over a first contact situation, or would the Federation have assumed control and made the scientists advisors to the process? I get it, it's not supposed to be about personal glory, but credit where credit's due is still a thing in Trek. Anyway, before I go off on another tangent, I'll end the video here. Thanks for watching this breakdown on the various ways to traverse the Star Trek galaxy for your standard Federation citizen, and until the next sci-fi lore discussion or gameplay video, I've been Rick. Thanks again for watching, and goodbye.